welcome to another episode of Literary Gladiators, the show where we discuss and debate literature in all of its forms. If it's written work, it's game. Let's meet the panel. Hi, I'm Rennie. Hi, I'm Sarah. <coughs> I'm enjoying a cucumber sandwich. And I'm Josh. Who are you? Or do you have an identity crisis going on? <laughs> she said that I was a cucumber sandwich, so that means you must be Josh. I'm, I'm Josh. I'm I Josh. That that means, so, so there's it's five people cucumber. here. Right? I'm Josh. You're Ari. That's Sarah, and that's a cucumber sandwich. Yes, he must have had a rum soap cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But the cucumber sandwich. Uh, uh, Sarah uh, is eating last week's cucumber sandwiches. You know, it's, it's only been a week, so mm -hmm. it's okay. See, wait a minute. That's a week old. I mean, it's left over. Is it good? Uh, yeah, that's what matters. It's just as good. Yes. Uh, I think that they uh, let's talk about some barns already today. We're going to be going over a short story by Juna Burns, uh, Juna Barnes, and it the story is called Smoke. And the discussion starter that I have for this story is literary gladiators. What do you feel this piece says about family traditions and what it means to carry the family name? Mm, well, I, I think that if I want to, I, I did my research on this, and even though this, the, the short story book was published in the 80s, I believe this was written in around the 10s, like the 19s. In the teens. Yes. Yeah. All the stories in, in that short story book with smoke were written for newspapers. They were newspapers, and so, they are not considered exactly her best work, but from Smoke, she evidently developed Nightwood, which was her big novel. Yeah, Nightwood was her Nightwood signature was piece, big one. and uh, a lot of it had to do with the fact that it was a pioneer in lesbian fiction. It was the potato thing, or was that a different, was that a different book by her? That could have been different, I'm not sure. Uh, Juna Barnes like a, was like a, man, um, like a man feels like a boiling potato or something. I don't think it was Nightwood. Okay, this is another one that she did that mm. had that quote in it. But um, <clears throat> anyway, what I was going to say is the family name. Some people just are like, you know, I want to marry you. Let's have kids. Let's make a name for ourselves because we feel that like we want. Have you ever heard of? And again, I'm going into this religion. This is perspective. But you ever heard of the uh, be fruitful and multiply? Oh, yes. that's exact. I think this argues against it completely. Yes, that's my point. But I think that I feel that the people here in this piece marry because they need, they feel that they have to. Yeah, and it's like a force. But it's interesting how. In most cases, family takes on the perspective of, it takes the male perspective and carries the male name. I thought that was this interesting, does not. actually. I thought, I thought that it was interesting that the um, male was the, kind of the one that um, was being focused on. I, I disagree. I think it's so. female focused. Yeah. Well, because um, it, starts, it starts out as Zelka being the central character. Swartz, her husband, Fenkins, his father. In order to bring, uh, take the concentration away from the male part, they, uh, Zelka and Swartz's son is left unnamed. He's I, the only one left unnamed in the whole piece. Yeah, they, they use like the nickname, I think, like Sonny, but I don't think that's his um, Yeah, that's just, yeah, that's Sonny's just, just like a term that. to refer to a son. Yeah. I, mean, I, I guess, Josh, what you're saying actually makes sense now. I think about it because at the end, when it's talking about the, the new wife, uh, Little Leaf. Yeah. But no, at the very, it's, very end. The un, it's oh. the unnamed Where? Leaf. Un, unnamed son and Leaf. They have Little Leaf. Little Leaf marries Misha. Misha. And Misha just marries a Swedish woman. Yeah, the, the Swedish woman, like, when they're describing her, you can tell, like, it, it, it's like, oh, you know, this woman married, you know, this guy married this woman, you know. Like, look at all these bad qualities. It's like focusing on the woman a little bit. It's it's pretty much at this point it's the end of the family the, the uh, Thenkins generation, and uh, because they were very revered at the beginning, they were referred to as bullets because of the impact that they oh, yeah, had. Yeah, three bullets. Yeah. But I, I feel that this and this is probably something I might mention again. I feel like this short story would have been better as a song. Well, it's a poem. She wrote poetry. 
It could um, have been. I, th I think it's hard to tell what her intentions are. Um, she worked at the time, and she worked in experimental writing with the rest of them. Um, it doesn't have exactly a plot plot. Um, I think it's the kind of saying like the gene pool runs out. Mm -hmm. um, after a while, it turns to smoke. Mm -hmm. I exactly know what oh, she, yeah, she there, uses there was that smoke in, in several other things. Yeah, there was that mm -hmm. line about like it's out in a puff of smoke. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And in and in her in the novel, one of her characters translates into a spirit who translates into smoke, who then goes to the stars. Mm -hmm. There is oh, an interesting. That's an interesting observation. The fact that she refer she constantly relies on. The What's that called? There's a word for that. When something like a trope, is it a trope? There's a trope is usually viewed in a more negative way, but then well, not necessarily. I, I'm thinking of just when you use oh. a term over and over again to describe something. There's people that have. I know that people writers often use settings that they're familiar with. Like the majority of Stephen King's novels are set in Maine. Right. Yeah. Places he's been. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's not unusual. Yes. Well, we're, we're I like the I like the use of the word smoke because she mm -hmm. uses it in in different places at different times. And when we look at it, you know, smoke is obscuring, but sometimes actually you can see through smoke. So it turns smoke comes smoke. from fire. Usually, it comes from fire. It mm -hmm. can come from smoldering. It can be ephemeral, like up in smoke. It mm -hmm. can be long lasting. Mm -hmm. um, and yet yeah, she likes that. Yeah, and it dissipates. And um, the Egyptians called their souls, evidently, shades. It translates to shade. So she uses it also as a, a stand in for spirit or mm -hmm. a ghost or something. She doesn't use the word ghost, but mm -hmm. um, in that sense. And yet, supposedly, she didn't like symbolism, although mm -hmm. she was edited by T.S. Eliot. That's mm -hmm. really strange. Mm -hmm. What were you going to say, Sarah? Oh, um. Yeah, I guess going back a little bit, building off of that, um, there's such um, like a weight upon having a family name and having genes passed down, and there's the phrase, you know, like, uh, blood is thicker than water, um, but, like, you can't, mm -hmm. like, drink water, like, uh, like there's, you know, but you still have your actions as a person outside of your blood. Your blood doesn't make you And yet they, they often use the term, uh, keep a little iron in the blood. Oh yeah, that was one of the first, yeah. Um, when I was uh, mentioning earlier about the, the be fruitful and multiply thing, like a lot of there, a lot of people who are like, have as many kids as you can, get married as young as you can, and have like 50 kids, right. like like that. that is, but here it seems more like it's like, uh, you know, we gotta get married. I don't know if it ever actually mentions it's not their choice, but it, it almost feels like it isn't. Yeah, I think that, I think, to me, the, the and piece you're itself kind of living in a bit of reluctance or force or something along the lines. I'm not sure what the, sure what the word is. To me, with regard to the piece, I think that it was weird. I think that oh, the yeah. story itself wasn't. To me, it wasn't the greatest. But I think what it did fantastically was provoke thoughts and ideas. And to me, I think the. The greatest message that I got out of reading this is the fact that happiness is intuitive. It's not who you marry. It's not what your job is. It's not how fast you marry. It's, it all comes down to, because she even says uh, in the piece, uh, as per pages 178 to 179 in this great short stories by American women from Dover Thrift, mm -hmm. and that is uh, the... Uh, if you are poor, you like out, or if you are poor, you live out of doors. But if you are rich, you live in a lovely house. Uh, I feel that it's very strong with the fact that uh, even if you're rich and you seem and you and it seems like you have everything, uh, I think that you also create a sense of uh, restriction uh, upon yourself. And, and the and well, vice versa. Well, I think also well, she she's in. Among the early feminists, I mean, she was not that well known to me, but she knew everybody. She was a mm. journalist, actually. Mm -hmm. She's like Hemingway. She came out of journalism. She interviewed James Joyce when he wasn't mm. speaking to anybody but his wife. 
As I say, she was edited by T.S. Eliot. She was a friend of Ernest Hemingway. She was in, she lived in the village when the Dial was the big thing. She got published by Dial Publishers. Um, she was in Paris when they were all in Paris. So she, she's one of these persons who like, knew everybody, but I don't know how much she did. She was actually excellent illustrator and painter. She went to Pratt. I would have to see some of her uh, yeah, but artwork. Her, yeah, uh, and she illustrates her, her stories herself. Um, but um, because she's at this experimental time and in, in the early feminism, I think she is the kind of saying that, yes, um, everybody doesn't have to marry and women don't have to marry. Mm -hmm. So that abstract yes. picture on the cover of Smoke and Other Stories was by Barnes herself? Could be, yes. It could, I'll have to yes. see which issue it is. It could very well be. But uh, I want to make a is probably this it? a yes. That's that her, one. That's, yeah, that's her. Mm. Yep, yeah, we'll hold that up to the camera. Yes, yeah, that, that's a quite an interesting picture. Mm -hmm. But I was going to say, Joss, I'm about to make a very, very um, interesting and very. Um, I'm going to make a very interesting and a very probably surprising comparison that you're not expecting. I am feeling that certain, and, and hear me out here, I am hearing, feeling certain comparisons to this from this story to Shel Silverstein's The Missing Piece. And, and, and if you could give me a second to explain it, mm -hmm. I feel that when, with The Missing Piece you had something that was not complete. Mm -hmm. and, and he was rolling along and he's like, you know, you know, I'm looking for something, what am I looking for? And when he does find what he's looking for, in this case, kind of like being married, like, oh, I need to get married as soon as possible because that's just what the environment is telling me to do. And that's what's, you know, going to make me happy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But then when you do, you find out that it actually doesn't really mm -hmm. make you happy. It's just another brick in the wall, so to speak. Mm -hmm. In a way, I feel the same way with Missing Peace because he had that missing piece, and he was really urgently looking for something, he finds it, and then he's like, well, this isn't what really makes me happy. Mm -hmm. Like, it's the other things, the stuff you had mentioned, that big people, the intuitive stuff that made I think that, happy. I think that... It's just that, yeah, like, that's a more kiddie way. I think that the missing piece, uh, I think it comes down to lens and the way that uh, a story approaches a particular subject, and I think that the greater area of concentration uh, with this is just a very more complex yeah. and a different, a slightly well, different ending than something Bar like that. Barnes comes out of an age, she's not a contemporary of ours, she comes out of an age like in Ernest. Young women got married. That's what you did. And she's showing that this is not um, particularly the, the, what's going to satisfy or be happy for a number of people, including this character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And with that too, you know, she even said, you know, um, if you're poor, like, you don't have doorway or something along yeah. that nature and then if you're rich you have a house and while you know there's material positions and like you're not like it's not like needed for your technically for your survival to have like a house or a shelter but you're also thinking all right well you know when you're married um you also have more money if the man is working mm -hmm. and if you're not married right. you might not have the same opportunities to get that money and take care of yourself because women didn't yourself. always work back then yeah they didn't have the same it's interesting it, though. it yeah. seems like status was more important yes. back then yes. than yes. like yes, equality yes. and happiness yeah. yeah. which which and i she think this book did is marry. she was briefly engaged mm -hmm. she almost did marry herself but she, and then she died unmarried I if, if she that's did, a self-portrait she doesn't really look like someone better she was she was with somebody for two years and things didn't work out yeah. But uh, the uh, and her family life was very weird. Her her dad was a polygamist, and her paternal grandmother, uh, they they would sleep together when she was a teenager, and there were. Are we talking about the character? Or no, no, Barnes. No. Uh, there was speculation that they they could have engaged in sexual. Yes. And there was uh, has also been at times alleged that she was raped, although mm -hmm. that was never proven either. Mm -hmm. But um, I, for the time period, I wouldn't be surprised at that either. So, her, as, as John Tron once said, 1910 times were weird. 1910 times were scary. Mm. My parents were born in 1910, both of them. <laughs> 1910 was one of the coldest, wettest summers ever, I can tell you that. Looks like we're in for the same thing this mm -hmm. summer. In New Jersey. Oh, yeah, it's pretty in New Jersey. 
we, we did get away with a mild winter where there was barely, the only major snow that I had to deal with was uh, driving uh, my special guest Ellie home from uh, the Alice Paul Institute. Yeah, there wasn't much snow. Um, but it, it seems like what this book is is kind of saying overall is what's what is a relationship? What would you define it as? Like back in the nineteen tens and stuff, twenties, like people got married because it was a status thing, and they because it was so important to keep the family name and, and pass it on. It didn't matter, like if, yeah, yeah loved them or not like it's just that's what happened but nowadays like people wait so long before even getting into relationships because they want to make sure this is the right person yeah, yeah. I, 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 I it, it, it shows just how much first. time has changed mm -hmm. the career comes first. well the other thing is in 1910 um your mortality was half what it is today it was 41 not 80 or whatever it is, 75 for women, 70. That's true. Oh, yeah, the, uh, kind of the age. Yes, right. Life My grandmother yeah. died at 41, having her last baby in 1921. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's partly a matter of survival. What mm -hmm. were you going to do? Hey, I'm going to go back to Romeo and Juliet. If her father really throws her out, what are her choices? She can't become a secretary. She can't become a school teacher. She can't code. She can become a nun, maybe. Mm -hmm. What could she do? But her choices are so yes. If you become a nun, you're not going to have any. choice was very so long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's Barnes is with this. Mm -hmm. the, the, the choices are limited, but they're not as limited as you think they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm going to go back to what I said before, and I'm going to say, I, I feel that this is portraying an interesting message, but as a short story, I'm not digging it. Yeah, I don't think I, I don't think she was a terrific writer to be honest. I wonder I'm gonna read Nightwood, I think. I think that would be something I would prob I would want to read Nightwood before I make an overall yes, judgment. But this was, and I think I'll check it out and there's a couple other this, things. I think like works that I've read before, uh, this work did more to uh, spark a message than it had any uh, actual appeal. I, to I it. take it this is not the person that Barnes and Noble was named after, right? No. No. It was probably it was named after probably the two people that found it. I'd, I'd have to look it up, but I just thought it might be. I yeah, sure. I would think that it would be the two people that found it. It's like J.C. Penney was the man that founded uh, the uh, store chain. Got it. Sears and Roebuck. Right. Uh, what not? But any final thoughts? If I had to read this five star like out of five stars with half stars permitting i'd probably give it a two it it it, 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 it portrayed a message but i didn't feel much else mm -hmm. like it, it you could once you read the story you get what the message is saying but it, it was a little bit confusing actually at the beginning of this discussion that's mm -hmm. how not great the writing was mm -hmm. yeah but like it <sighs> I think it could have been written better by somebody else, but it's a it is a good message. I will say that, and I think Barnes uh, did attempt to you know write what she felt, and that's what's important. I'll give it uh, a like Ari a two, maybe a two and a half as a short story because I think it's that Barnes was one of the women that the feminists from the '60s and '70s was looking for writers who had not been acknowledged and not been given uh, attention and like Afra Benson, there was a short magazine named after her for a while after it became Ms. And so they were looking for instance Mary Shelley, they resurrected her for Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Now Frankenstein is read in all the high schools and I think Barnes is one of these women and especially with new gender studies, they're looking for people to feature and I think that's kind of how she comes mm -hmm. about. She is, her, her biography is really interesting. As I say, she lived when they all did and she knew everybody on a first name basis, but I don't think as a writer, she was a, a, a good example or strong mm -hmm. uh, artist. If, we're, uh, if we were gonna rate uh, uh, Smoke, uh, I, I would actually give it a three because I still, I didn't think it was, it didn't have much, uh, Strength to it as far as the story itself is concerned. It didn't but have strength, but it had substance. 
I think it did. I think it had uh, food for thought, and I think that it would be something that I'd be willing to re-examine. Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I would think. I think that it is Wait, food worth. Do you say food for thought? <sighs> yeah. But look, her sandwich is gone. Oh, Where did it go? Where did the sandwich go? Find out next time on Literary Gladiators. Mm -hmm. But, Food uh, for thought. Huh? Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I would I give. Asking in a surprise way. I would give this piece some marginal approval. Uh, I would. Uh, I wouldn't uh, highly encourage people to check it out, but uh, I would. Uh, I would say uh, maybe examine it, but uh, be prepared to be disappointed. Um, yeah, I would if. It would they give it a rating, I'd probably give it like a, a two and a half. Some of her work choice was, was thought provoking, and I, I liked her certain uh, strings of thought that she had, but otherwise, um, it felt lacking at the end. I didn't, didn't feel too strongly about it. If, um, I, if I may just say something, I personally, this is me personally, I feel that viewers, that you're going to get more about this book from what we just said than by reading it again. You mean the story? Yes, I'm not saying don't read it, but I'm saying that what we basically have covered is what is in that in the story. Mm -hmm. The only other things that are in there are character names and, and the actual substance mm -hmm. of the story. The the we've pretty much gone yeah, over the, everything and the, the sequence of events. Yes, because sequence of events. Everybody uh, is gone by the end except for Misha and, and the Swedish lady. his sisters and the Swedish lady. They don't say much about uh, the demise of. The unnamed son, but uh, perhaps it's not pertinent to the story. Yeah, yeah well, that's sometimes because it's characters female are unnamed uh, to make centered. it universal. Oh, there was also sometimes the they are unnamed because they are yes. insignificant. Yeah. There was also the stillborn, yeah, the stillborn which we never really. Unnamed. But it was very interesting the the closure, the whole idea that the statement is made about uh, the baby's seen as an interrupted plan and not. Uh, uh, even had it. But life. yes, of course. Uh, and up until yeah. adulthood, they're referred to as it. They're not referred to as he or he she. she. Right. Yeah. But if you are interested in checking out this story, um, uh, Josh has this great short wow. stories by American Women book. And um, you can get probably get this at like Barnes and Noble or where did you get it? I got this? it right off of Dover Publications website. Okay. But I've read Life in the Iron Mills by Rebecca Harding Davis, which was okay. Uh, later in the season, we're going to be going over Sweat by Zora Neale Hurston, and I read that. It was excellent, and I'm really excited to Did discuss it. Did you say Zora? It. Yep, Zora Neale Hurston. Zora. <laughs> That's almost <laughs> But be sure to join us next time for another episode of Literary Gladiators. For now, keep, keep reading. reading.